Welcome to today's webinar called What's That? How to Know if a Car Seat is Legit or Not. This uh, webinar is brought to you by the Lifesavers National Conference on Highway Safety Priorities and Safe Kids Worldwide. It was originally scheduled for Lifesavers, but due to COVID-19, we are now able to offer it as a webinar. So if you are watching with friends, only the person who's registered will get the CEU confirmation. So if you are doing a little bit of a watch party, at least six feet apart, um, you just wanna assign an organizer, use a sign-in sheet, and then enter the CEU as an in-person session. So there's gonna be a lot of information today, and we have a jam-packed 90 minutes. But basically, by the end, you'll be able to discuss the issue of uh, non-compliant seats, share information on non-U.S. seats and the U.N. versus the U.S. federal safety standards, uh, discuss how to address the issue of non-compliant seats in the field, and of course, the role of NHTSA in managing counterfeit seats. And we're going to do that by having you hear from four really fantastic speakers. The first person you're going to hear from is Denise Donaldson with Safe Ride News followed by Sarah Haverstick of Good Baby International, Jennifer Rubin with Dignity Health Mercy San Juan Medical Center and Safe Kids Greater Sacramento, and Dr. Beth Wolf with the NHTSA Trends Analysis Division. And now I'd like to introduce Denise, who's gonna kick us off. Take it away, Denise. Hi, thanks, Carrie, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Like Carrie said, we started developing this presentation for the Lifesavers Conference, and that was several months ago. And since then, the urgency of this topic has done nothing but continue to grow. Um, as the intended moderator of that in-person session, what I'm going to do is just give a brief introduction and then turn it over to our three subject area experts. Over the past several years, globalization and the rise in online sales has set the stage for the introduction of car seat-like devices that are not compliant, meaning they don't meet Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 213. And while the door was just kind of cracked several years ago, it seems like it's wide open now, as you've no doubt noticed a recent wave of dangerous fakes on the market. At this point, we seem to be overwhelmed by the sheer variety of these non-compliant product types. Next slide. So for instance, the type that's been in the news the most are knockoffs of specific legitimate models. Of course, these are ripping off both the consumer and the legitimate company. And the risks are way greater than say for knockoff handbags, right? Because so, unsurprisingly to make money on the cheaper version, the parts and construction are cheaper too. So a sled test of the Duna knockoff shown here proved it would completely fail in a crash. So these knockoffs are not the value that buyers think they are, but in fact are putting their children at grave risk. Next slide. And there are other counterfeits out there as well that resemble what we know as a car seat, but again, they're made of inferior materials that wouldn't hold up in a crash, and they lack other key requirements of 213 like labels. Next slide. And then there are what I would call imposters. These don't meet 213 and they don't even meet the definition of what 213 would call a car seat. Yet they're being marketed online for use by young children, even babies, not to mention for extremely low enticing prices. So um, the one shown here, which you can find on many websites in many different styles, it's usually just called simply a portable child seat. This one is especially terrifying as Jennifer Rubin's gonna explain later in this presentation. Next slide. And beyond imposters, there's what I'd call decoys. These are devices that, well, they're they're not, they're definitely not compliant to 213, but they also don't outright claim to be. But um, with FMVSS 213 covering car seats for use by children up to 80 pounds, you can see that these devices are being promoted for use by children who clearly should be riding in a 213 compliant device instead. And of course, the language of each state's child occupant protection law requires that children ride in a compliant car seat. So that would disallow these decoys as well as any other non-compliant seats. Next slide. And state laws also require the use of car seats that are compliant to US regulations, but more and more we're seeing car seats that are compliant, but only to the standards of another country. So Sarah Haverstick will talk a bit about why these should not be used here and how to spot them. Next slide. 
And lastly, I'd also like to point out the growing threat of other car seat related add-ons and accessories that are out there in a growing number. In fact, just a couple days ago, you may have seen that NHTSA posted a safety advisory warning about an aftermarket rear-facing vehicle add-on seat, or if, if you didn't, you can easily find it by searching little passenger seat online. I just tried that out. And uh, so you should check that out. Also alarming are these aftermarket latch sets, um, like these ones shown here. Many of these are being offered online. So please be on the lookout for these dangerous add-ons. Uh, and just know if it's aftermarket latch, it's always fake latch. So those lower anchors, you can't retrofit. So when it comes to all these types of non-compliant products, I think many purchasers may be completely unsuspecting or at least well-meaning. And unfortunately, a super low price can sometimes coax people into suspending their disbelief. Um, an element of online sales that's really fed into this problem is the influx of marketplaces selling directly from China, like AliExpress, and the addition of third-party uh, sellers on Amazon and Walmart.com. So while responsible websites can try to shut these sellers down, you've probably heard already the analogy of whack-a-mole. You know, it's easy for them to pop right back up somewhere else, and that's what they do usually. So what we have is kind of like a perfect storm going on with more caregivers shopping online, and you know, they're probably looking for good deals, especially now. <laughs> and then there's a growing number of bad characters out there who are taking advantage of ways to evade oversight through, on through the online sales routes that are available. So it's just gonna be really important for CPSTs to be proactive in their education of the public, to be vigilant and looking out for them, and then to know what to do when they spot a fake in use. And with that, I'll pass this along to our first speaker, Sarah Haverstick, the safety advocate for Good Baby International. Thank you, Denise. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, and thank you, Carrie and Safe Kids, for hosting us. We were sad not to present at Lifesavers, but I think that is your win for everybody on the line right now, that now we get to share this with a much wider audience, which is exciting. So my piece is a little bit different. As Denise mentioned, I'm going to bring in kind of that foreign compliant component. We're a car seat manufacturer that manufactures seats in multiple countries to multiple different regulatory standards. So what does that mean and how are different regulatory standards related or different? And that's where we're gonna go today. And this is maybe a little bit tongue in cheek. And, and as I think noted earlier, Lifesavers was meant to happen in Tampa, Florida. So right down the road from Disney World. But as Denise was mentioning too, I mean, it really is a small world after all. And it is increasingly easy for consumers to inadvertently purchase product, whether that's a knockoff product or a foreign non-compliant in the US product, uh, it becomes a lot easier for families to get their hands on those. And I hear from technicians with some frequency with some maybe suspicious products that they have run across in the field. So today we're going to compare and contrast some portions of the UN regulatory standards for car seats and the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. The one thing I can promise you is I've got like 20 minutes to do this. So you will not be an expert on either standard by the time we are done with this. I just wanted to pull out some of the really interesting pieces that I thought were relevant for us as technicians to be aware of. We'll also talk about how these regulations impact the design and the development of the child restraint. And then at the end, I always like to pull it together with some curbside messaging. So the things that you can remember that can be top of mind when you're working with families out in the field. And we're going to do all of this through the lens of the Cybex Serona S, which is a product that we have compliant in the UN under the R129 I size uh, regulation. And then we are also now have compliant in the US under the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. So we're gonna look and see, you know, really what does it take to get from one regulation to another regulation? I've shown this map in other presentations before with lots of other regulatory standards. So this is by no means all of the regulatory standards that exist in the world for car seats. However, these are the ones we're going to focus on today. FMVSS 213 in blue, which obviously we're all familiar with, and then R44 and R129. Uh, we're primarily going to look at R129 today since that's the standard that the product we're comparing is, uh, is compliant to. But you can see 
in purple, there are a number of countries across the world that accept both R44 and R129. So if you think things can get complicated and confusing in the United States, imagine being, you know, a technician in Germany where you could have a family buying a seat that's compliance R44 or a seat that's compliance R129, two quite different standards. So right now they're both running in parallel. There's potential for R44 to make some changes. Uh, the future of that is currently in discussion. But for now, they could purchase a product under either of them. Today, we're primarily going to focus on R129. So how do we get there? How do we go from this European idea and compliant product to a compliant product in the United States? I'm sure many of you were able to quickly pick out which one of these was the UN versus the US seat in my first slide. But you can see the UN product is on the left, the US is on the right. They're both called the Cybex Serona S. They're both convertible car seats. They look pretty similar and they have a lot of similarities. They both have a load leg. I think many of us know and are aware that load legs really kind of originated in Europe and a lot of that had to do with the UN regulatory standards. So we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Both of these seats offer a 360 degree rotation. That's not unique to this product. There are many seats under the UN standards and in European market that have this 360 degree rotation piece. Uh, so it's just not something that we are as used to seeing in the United States. They both have an anti-rebound bar design. They both have additional side impact protection. They both have no rethread harnesses, magnetic buckle storage, as well as sensor safe technology. And I threw this one in in hopes that I could maybe throw some people off because I think we often see, especially in stock photos for car seats, European products that don't have a chest clip. And I think many technicians are aware that previously European products were not allowed to have chest clips because of a, a requirement for a one hand release. And that is true still for seats certified and, and compliant under R44, but under R129, that chest clip is allowed. So I threw that in just to kind of throw you off a little bit. So can you spot the differences? Sometimes they're not as easy to see with your eyes. So we're going to start first with the UN product. And I wanted to start by looking at just the child specs. That's something that we're all used to looking at. When can that product be used? The first big thing to know under R129 is that their emphasis is really on stature or the child's height. This is a metric that consumers uh, in other countries in the world are very used to understanding and knowing about their child. And it was a, a metric that really wasn't as prevalent under the R44 seats. And they found that consumers were often confused about which product was really appropriate for the size of their child. So R129 was really designed to make this a lot easier for consumers to understand. So I want you to note both the rear facing and forward facing specs here, they max out just over 41 inches and just under 40 pounds. It's a little bit lower than probably what we're used to seeing. The big note here is you'll see the difference in forward facing is the higher height minimum for a child. The other piece to R129, this started phasing in in 2013, and they really wanted to emphasize keeping kids rear facing longer. Remember back in 2011, that's when the AAP made some statements about keeping kids rear facing as long as possible. So in 2013, that was the emphasis here. So the minimum height for forward facing is 76 centimeters and 15 months, they added an age into that component as well. So for our US seat, the thing that I want you to notice just immediately is that our product usage time is a lot longer. We're rear facing to 50 pounds, forward facing to 65 pounds. And this is much different than what you see with the European counterpart in the other product. And some of that has to do with the regulation. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So one of the big differences with the products is in terms of regulatory requirements is the installation method. With this product, I mentioned this is our eye size seat. The only option for installation is Isofix. And for those that aren't aware, Isofix is similar to our latch system, except that it's a rigid lower anchor connector. And that's what you see circled on the screen here. So that rigid lower anchor connector is the only attachment method. R129 really wanted to emphasize ease of use for the consumer. And what they found, not unlike what we see in the United States, 
there's a lot of misuse. And they found that there was less misuse if the consumers were using the Isofix connectors. So that was really the big emphasis. Let's get them into these Isofix connectors. And as you can imagine, Isofix connectors come with a weight limit, just like our lower anchor connectors in our vehicles. In this case, the, ISO, uh, the Isofix connector weight limit is a combined weight of no more than 33 kilograms, which is just under 73 pounds. A seat like this that has the low leg, that has that rotational feature, this is a pretty heavy product. So that's where you see some of that lower weight range available to the child uh, that would be occupying the seat because this is their only installation method. Now, under R129, you could have a belt attached car seat. Uh, so a seat belt option, that is, that's an option now. They phase things in and that's now a, available as an option. However, the you can if you have a harness car seat you can only have one installation method so you can only use isofix or you can only use a seat belt you can't have both of those available on one product again trying to limit the misuse for the consumer so for the us immediately we needed to make changes because of our regulation so our regulatory requirements under 213 are that we need a seatbelt installation option and we need a lower anchor or latch installation option. So for us, this meant, yeeps, we don't have a belt path on our European product. So immediately we needed to think about what can we do to add a belt path? So that's where we did here. We had to create a belt path and then we had to think about what type of lower anchor installation did we want to have rigid latch uh, versus the flexible anchors. And we went with that flexible anchor option. Another big difference in the regulation comes in the anti-rotation device. So under R129, a car seat is required to have an anti-rotation device, and that device can either be a load leg or support leg, stability leg, whatever name you want to give that product, but it can either be that load leg or it can be a tether. One or the other, you don't need to have both, you just need to meet those metrics. Additionally, they have to have some kind of warning mechanism on the product to let the consumer know if they're misusing or not using that load leg. So they're only required to conduct their dynamic tests with that anti-rotation device in place because it's a requirement. However, if they don't have a mechanism that is sufficient enough or deemed sufficient enough by the regulator to adequately warn the consumer about misuse, they need to do a misuse test without the load leg as well. On our product, uh, as I showed you before, we have the load leg in our UNI size version. We do not have a tether for that product. So that limits the amount of testing that we would need to do. For our US product, there is no test configuration under 213 to test with a load leg. So we're launching this product with a load leg, but that means we have to conduct our compliance testing under 213, and we have to pass all of the 213 compliance tests without the use of a load leg. So both rear facing and forward facing, we have to do everything without the load leg. And then we do all of those tests again with the load leg in place. So it doubles the workload for the car seat manufacturer. Additionally, because we have to do tethered and untethered tests forward facing for NHTSA compliance, uh, we also have to do that here, uh, both with the, with the tether and without the tether, even though we also have that load leg in place. So even if you were using the load leg as your anti-rotation device in forward facing mode, we're still testing and encouraging the use of that tether for forward facing. The other thing that I think is a little bit interesting is the type approval process or the way that the car seat becomes certified in each country. So that way in the UN system is this type approval system, which essentially puts the regulatory body in control. So the certificate that you must have, this type approval certificate to sell your product is granted by a type approval authority, which is essentially that regulator. They, the regulator has determined some outside labs that are called technical services that are to conduct all of the testing that needs to happen. A manufacturer, if they have their own internal testing, could use their own facility, but it has to be overseen by that technical service that has been approved by that regulatory body, that type approval. And this all works through a process of mutual recognition. So if you are a manufacturer in Germany, you receive a type approval in Germany, that product and that seat could still be used in France as an example. After you sell a certain number of products, you have to take that product back to the technical service and then they're going to do a conformity of production test to make sure that your car seat still conforms to the approved type that you received. 
So hopefully you remember from certification class that our process in the United States looks a little bit different because the manufacturer is really the one responsible for this entire process until we sell the product. So the manufacturer in a process of self-certification has to determine which test configurations we need based on the type of seat and our modes of use and the 213 requirements. We can conduct that testing at our own internal facility or we can utilize a third party lab or very often companies do both if they have that opportunity. Regardless, it's up to the company to review those results. So even if they conduct testing at a third party lab, that lab is just going to give them a printout of all the results. They're not going to tell them, hey, you pass, you fail. They're gonna say, here you go, here's your results. And it's on the company to figure out, did we meet the metrics that we need to meet? Do we need to make any product changes or are we ready to go into production? If no product changes are necessary, you can go into production. And then we know once you start selling that product, that's when NHTSA as the regulatory authority is going to come in and do some compliance checks. And we talk about that in the certification course as well. They'll do some spot checks to make sure products really are meeting all of those requirements set forth in 213. However, if through that testing you decide, oh gosh, we need to make a change, then again, it's on that manufacturer to figure out what do you need to change? What are you going to do? Which new test configurations do you need to run? And then you go through that whole process again until you get to that point where you can check off all the boxes and actually start your production. I'm not gonna talk a ton about testing, but just wanted to give you that quick overview of when we talk about dynamic testing, what kinds of tests are we doing? So under 213, you know we do a frontal test. We do not do side impact testing under compliance right now. There is that NPRM expected to have some information at some point, uh, maybe later this year. And then we do inversion testing for aircraft. Under R44, it looks pretty similar in that they do a frontal test. There is no mandated side impact testing, but they also do rear impact for rear facing seats and a rollover test. R129, I mentioned, is the newest of these and rolled out in 2013. So as the newest standard, they've updated their frontal crash testing standards. They do incorporate a side impact test, and then they have that rear impact and the rollover, and they use an updated series of ATDs. So when we talk about this in terms of changes and testing, we're taking a product that we are selling under R129 that we have gone through all of the test protocols. It has been rigorously tested under R129, but as you've seen, a lot related to our regulations, we've already had to make changes to it. Now we have to test all of these changes that we've made. And when you do testing, it's always in phases and never is that first phase perfect. You're always making changes along the way until you get to that seat that you're going to sell. So for this product in particular with the complexities and with the load legs, that means you're doing roughly 600 tests throughout the development. And this is just the compliance test. For 213, that means this is just that frontal crash test for compliance in all the modes of use that we need to do. And for us, we count the load leg test, even though it's not really a NHTSA compliance test, because we're going to duplicate all of our non-load leg tests, we, encount, we count that load leg test as well in this number. But then we also do more testing. So we do side impact, we do structural, we do rollover. So all of these other additional tests, I mean, depending on the complexity of the product, you're talking anywhere from 800 to 1,000 crash tests for a product in order to become compliant under this 213 standard. But there's more than just crash testing and there's more than just crash testing that's a requirement of 213. So there's product integrity tests and those are required under the certification. So that means uh, some of the 13, there's the breaking strength of webbing, there's the permanency of labels. All of those are requirements that we have to do with our product under the 213 standard. However, there's other things that happen and come up with specific products that you'll also do under product integrity testing because you want to make sure the product is always going to function the way that you intend for it to function. And in this case, which is totally different than our UN seat, we had to add this belt path. And because we had to add this belt path, the area that we added it is, you know, basically exactly where a messy toddler is going to put their feet when they're rear facing. I have a 19 month old. I know exactly how messy they can be and how much stuff could potentially be attached to those shoes or the food that might be back there with them. So we created a debris ingestion test for this product in particular because we wanted to make sure that anything that comes off of that child uh, doesn't make it into the mechanisms that would that would 
render the product not to work the way that we want it to. Uh, so we created this test as an example of something that we needed to do to make sure that product was always going to function the way that we need it to function. I wanted to end my portion with some really visual things. So while some of those differences and changes you might not notice, there are some things that are very visual and labels are one of those. So this is that airbag warning label that we are all very familiar with on rear facing car seats. Do not place that rear facing child seat on a front seat with an airbag. It has a nice visual image. You can see it's got that orangey yellow big block with the warning. All of this is federally mandated in 213. This is exactly how we need to create this label. So this is what it would look like in the United States. Notice there's a lot of text on that label. This is the UN counterpart. This is what you would find on that Serona SI size. Notice it's got a lot of imagery. If you remember back to that map that I showed you at the very beginning, the sheer number of different countries and different languages that are spoken in all of these countries that roll up under this UN regulatory standard, it would be virtually impossible to fit all of those languages onto a label and still make that legible for the consumer to understand. So instead, with many of these seats under the UN standard, you see information that is very pictorial, lots of imagery, and then pointing you back to product instructions because product instructions is where that information will actually be translated into different languages for you. So when you come across a product, if something seems suspicious to you, if you see a product that has a lot of labels that just have images on them, that would be a big red flag because under our standard, there's a lot of text that we have to incorporate onto our labels. So right away, that would be one that would, you know, kind of put my spidey senses up and make me think maybe there's something else going on here. Compliance labels are another really important place to look. And thankfully, the UN compliance label, it's pretty obvious. It's bright orange. So many times when I have received emails from technicians with that suspicious product that they found at a fitting station appointment or at a car seat check, and they send me some images, I've been able to spot this bright orange label and say, aha, I think this might be a foreign product. Uh, so this is the R44 version of the label. This is the R129 version. This is the label that comes on that Serona S that we've been looking at. It's not terribly important that you recognize what each line of this label means, but note that it shows you, especially look at the one on the right, it gives you the company name, that's an important piece of information, and it tells you what regulatory standard it meets. So it's UN Regulation 129. That's a really important piece of information, and that would be a good key to you to understand, okay, I see this orange label, I mean, I can't promise you it's not a knockoff orange label or it's not a knockoff of a foreign product. However, immediately it leads me to believe this is not a product that's compliant in the United States. By contrast, this is what our label looks like in the United States on that same Serona S, so our US version of this product. Note the number of words on this label. You know, because you've seen car seats out in the field, you know what car seats look like. You've seen all these labels with all these words. Most of these words are prescribed to us in 213. The most important word for you to see on this label is in red, and it must be in red, and it tells you that this restraint is certified for use in motor vehicles. That's an important piece of information that you will find on all US compliant products. The next statement is going to tell you whether or not it's approved in aircraft, uh, note that there's contact information for how to get in touch with the manufacturer on here. That's a requirement. There's contact information for how to get in touch with NHTSA on here. That's also a requirement. If you can't find this information on your product, that should raise some immediate red flags to you. And I said we were only talking about UN products for this, but Denise very rightly asked if I would add in some additional compliance labels, just so you know, you might come across these from some other standards. So we'll start with Canada, since especially, you know, our friends that are in the north of the United States along the Canadian border may come across some of these products. Any car seat that is compliant in Canada under their CMVSS regulation will have the national safety mark label. So that's this maple leaf label that you see on screen. Uh, this is the Chinese compulsory certification label. Uh, you may find this on a product. You may find this on a product with an orange R44 label. 
Uh, those two regulations are fairly similar, so there's potential for some harmonization for a company right there. Uh, so that's one. This is actually the one that I end up seeing the most frequently, oddly enough, because uh, there's also a label under the CCC that says GB on it. So I think technicians, you know, good baby GB, they see that label and have sent me seats to say, is this one of your products? Uh, turns out it has nothing to do with our company and is just related to that CCC standard. And then there's the Australia, New Zealand. So uh, I know there's some really active technicians down, uh, down under down there. So they have their own certified product label and this is what you would find on their compliant car seats. So at the end of the day, to finish out my part of this presentation, you know, what do we need to remember when we're working with families out in the field? And I think the first thing is, and this is why I wanted to end on those labels and markings, that's a very visual thing that you can see on a product. And it's something that we should always be looking at at Carsey Checks. We always are looking for that data manufacturer, is the product expired? What's the model number? Can we check for any recalls? That's information you're used to looking at already. So if you see any of these other identifiable things, labels that are mostly pictures, labels that have languages other than English, there's a chance, you know, especially speaking for my brands, when we harmonize a product with Canada, we'll put our English and French labels because French labels are also required in Canada. So you might see that, but you should always find text in English on a US compliant product. So if you see, or you can't find any text in English on the product, that would be an immediate red flag right away. Encourage consumers to contact the car seat manufacturer directly. We say that all the time, you know, but if you're ever in doubt, if you have a question, you should be able to find that company's information and reach out to them, put it on that car seat manufacturer to tell you whether or not that is a legit product or a knockoff product. And there should be enough identifiable information that you can do that. If you can't figure out who that car seat manufacturer is by the information in front of you, that would be another really big red flag right away. An important piece to remember, especially because we're talking about foreign seats, you know, all compliant car seats are safe and provide excellent protection when they're used appropriately. So this means these foreign seats, that Serona SI size that I showed you throughout this presentation, that seat is very safe. It has been rigorously crash tested under the R129 standard. It meets all of that criteria to be used in a country that accepts the R129 standard. It's just not compliant to be used under our standard in the United States. This might mean that there are times where you are faced with that good, better, best kind of decision making where you have to, you know, you're faced with that family that shows up because they found a really great deal on a travel system online and they bring it to you at their fitting station. And it turns out as you're looking over the product, it seems like maybe it's certified in Europe under one of these UN standards and you find that orange label. But if the family is there with you and the baby is there with you and you have no other option to get that baby home safely, it might be one of those situations where your best option is to help them understand how to use that product safely in the immediate need to transfer that child home. And then you explain to that caregiver why it is so important that they are able to purchase a product that is compliant to our standard in the United States. And we're going to, as our, the rest of our speakers, we'll discuss a little bit more in detail about some ways that you can make sure that the product that you are purchasing is actually compliant in the United States. So that's my last point. You should always purchase a product that's approved for use in the country in which you live. So even though that Serona SI size is a fabulous seat, works really well, it's approved for use in a country that accepts the UN standard. Our country does not. Our country has our own compliance standard. So you need to purchase a product that is compliant to the 213 standard in the United States. This is my contact information. I'm always happy to help. Uh, you can always send pictures. I love looking at them when folks find these suspicious images. So it's, it's fun to try to troubleshoot what's going on. And big acknowledgements to our two regulatory gurus, Dinos and Phil on our team, because it's been a really fun learning experience for me over the last year and a half or so. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer Rubin with Safe Kids Greater Sacramento. Thanks, Sarah. So now we're going to share some stories from the field and hopefully take what we've learned from our manufacturer friends and our certification class and our CEU classes and go and try and apply it out in the field. Next slide, please. So I'm going to share some stories from our coalition here in Sacramento. 
And then I'm gonna share what to look for when you suspect a fake product. And Sarah's given us some of those already. And then why might caregivers have chosen that product? And what should we say to them? How should we react in hopefully a kind and informative manner? And then what are the next steps you can take as a technician? So to do that, I'm gonna share two stories from our coalition. And in both of these cases, the technician encountered a possible imposter device. So not quite like the foreign devices that Sarah was talking about, but in this case, we're gonna talk about some imposter devices. They came across them at their fitting station or their program, and then they contacted a local instructor, that was me, uh, to confirm that that product was not an approved car seat or booster seat. And then I helped them follow up with some product research, and together we contact, contacted some national experts. Next slide, please. All right, so our first story comes from Carrie from our coalition, and she contacted me and said, Hi, Jen, have you ever heard of a product called Clipix? A family friend that is a super safe mom spotted it online and asked me about it. It is sold on Amazon. Is it safe to use? And my response was, no, I've never heard of this product. So we started with just a Google search and we were able to find the manufacturer's website and we also saw it sold on Amazon. So here's the manufacturer's website. And it says right on the homepage that it is USA crash tested and certified. And it is built to surpass NHTSA guidelines. All right, so we're making some claims already. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of a closer look at the product. And it's a set of straps with a clip on either end, and it is claiming to replace a booster seat. And you can see on the right there, there's some weight and height limits that are listed that might be similar to typical booster seats. So it clips to the lap and shoulder belt, and then it tightens to, I guess, bring the shoulder belt portion down to a level that's comfortable for the child. All right, so just from a first look, for me, this doesn't look safe. I don't see how it would provide the belt positioning features needed to qualify as a booster seat, especially on the lap belt. It's not really providing lap belt positioning. But in the end, that's not necessarily up to me. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a regulating body, so I need to do some more research and see if this is something that's safe for families to use. Next slide, please. So just one more view of the product. I wanted to show you, this is a picture I think Denise took actually. Um, the product does have some labels on it that look like the typical labels that we're used to seeing. So that leads me to, next slide please, our visual check. So right when a family pulls up to our fitting station or our checkup event, what can we look for? What are some things that should jump out to us to see if this is a fake or imposter product? So first we're gonna see if it has a registration card. All of our car seats and booster seats sold in the US must have that registration postcard that we can mail in. So next we're gonna look and see, does it have an instruction manual? If it's sold here in the US, it should be in English, it should have proper grammar, and it should have all the typical warnings that we see at the beginning of an instruction manual. And if it's missing any of those things, that's a big red flag. We're also gonna look and see if it has a harness retainer clip or chest clip, because as Sarah mentioned, all of our current US harness models do have that harness retainer clip, and they're not often used in other countries. And then we're gonna look for those labels. Like Sarah said, we're, uh, we've got a whole lot of labels that are required on our seats here in the US. And we're used to looking for them and using them as CPSTs. We're looking for weight limits and height limits and uh, the model name and manufacturer date. So we're really used to looking for those labels and if they aren't there, that's a huge red flag. Next slide, please. So how did this shake out in Carrie's case? What did we see here with this Clipix product? Yes, it did have a registration card. Yes, it had an instruction manual. Didn't have a chest clip because it's not a harness product. Um, but it did have labels that at first glance would look very similar to what we're used to seeing. So you can see how this makes this confusing for caregivers. Um, it's hard for caregivers that aren't CPSCs. They can really be easily fooled by these products that look and act like uh, a seat that might be safe to use. Next slide, please. All right, so because all those visual cues checked out, we had to do some more research. So we went to the point of purchase. Um, we looked on Amazon, and one thing I saw when I saw the product on Amazon that it, was that it had a really small number of reviews. I think the first time I looked, there were maybe six or seven reviews on the page. 
So that's a big red flag. We know that that might not be a widely used or approved product. And then here was the real test. I went to our trusted list of seats. So this is a great resource. The American Academy of Pediatrics on their website, healthychildren.org, has a list of car seats. It has a list of brand name and models. And um, right at the top of the page, it says car seats, product listing for 2020. And then at the bottom, it reminds us these seats meet um, FMVSS 213 as of the production of the list. So this is a great place to look. And sure enough, Clipix was not on that list. I also went over to NHTSA's ease of use ratings, not there either. So between the two, I'm starting to think that I might need to file a report on this product or help Carrie do it. And so just in learning how to do that, that was this was my first time doing that. I went over the, to the NHTSA website and I was trying to file a report on the NHTSA website. And at that time, to be able to do that, I had to select from a drop down menu and select the name of the manufacturer. And Clipix wasn't there. So um, I, Beth is gonna tell us in a moment about an update to that process, but I was not able to report online. So knowing that this is probably a fake, I didn't see this manufacturer name on the AAP site or on the ease of use ratings website or on the reporting website. All right, I think it's really time to sound the alarm about this product. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we contacted some national experts. I sent a shout out on our CPS email listserv. That's the Yahoo group that's still going strong after all these years and received some responses right away of folks saying that we've seen this product too. There were some folks in Wisconsin and Denise and folks up in Washington that said, yes, we've seen this product come through our fitting station. So I went ahead and sent an email to Laura Dunn over at NHTSA. Um, I don't know if they want us all emailing them directly. We can, should probably report through the website, um, which Beth will update us on how to do that. So I emailed Laura and she was able to get a response for me. Next slide, please. All right. So Laura said, this comes from Zach Frazier in our enforcement division, who is the FMVSS 213 compliance test engineer. This product is not a child restraint system. We consider these types of devices to be aftermarket products and therefore not subject to the standard. However, the manufacturer may not make claims that it meets 213 in its advertising, product literature, or package marketing, or package marketing. So I will be discussing this with NHTSA Chief Counsel to determine if and what steps are necessary moving forward. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. And Laura added that I was able to share that with the CPS listserv. All right, so there we go. I have made my report and done my report part as a technician. And my role from there is then to take that information back to my community. So to talk with the technician and caregiver and let them know that no, it is not safe to use. All right, so our conclusion was, not safe to use. And I asked the technician to call that family back and share the NHTSA response. And then her next step is to help them explore other products that might fit their needs. And we're also able to help Denise with a Safe Ride News article on the topic back in 2018. Next slide, please. All right, so that was our first time through. We had a little experience with it. And now it happened again in our coalition not long after that. Um, so this is some communication I got from Laurel, a technician in our coalition, and um, she texted me. So this is our live text message response here. She said, I have a client here that wants me to check this portable car seat. No serial number, no made date, no name. And I was in a little disbelief. I replied, is there any brand name on it? She said, nothing. They got them on Groupon. I replied, does it have a harness retainer clip? I don't see one in the pictures, and this is usually a clue, like Sarah said, and she said, nope, with a big thumbs down emoji. So next slide. All right, so this is what Laurel was seeing. These were the text messages and the photos she was sending me right when she was standing there with the caregiver. And this looks really similar to what Denise showed us back in the beginning of her presentation, uh, one of these, quote unquote, portable car seats. So Laurel sent me these pictures of this device in the family's car, and she said it was attached to the vehicle seat with two straps that go over the back of the vehicle seat. And she described that the buckles looked like they were similar to what you might find on a backpack and not those robust buckles we're normally used to seeing on car seats. Next slide, please. 
So she continued telling me the story from the caregiver and she said, the kids are two and three. And her response was, it's not like they'll be in them all the time and that she wanted to use them so bad. And I said, well, if they're low income, you can refer them to our program where we give out seats to caregivers and families in need. And she replied, no, she's not low income. She just didn't want to deal with quote unquote bulky car seats. So next slide, please. All right, so let's do our research process again. What's going on with this product? So first we would check the labels. In this case, there weren't any. There was nothing to check. There was no manufacturer name that I could look up on healthychildren.org or any of the list of trusted seats. Um, I went to the, tried to go to the point of purchase and I just Googled portable car seat and found a whole lot. <laughs> like Denise showed earlier, um, they were on Groupon, they were on Walmart com being sold by third-party sellers. They were on countless websites, foreign and domestic, and we really couldn't determine the manufacturer. I don't know who's making these products in the end. Um, so just without a lot of information to go on, again, I contacted the Yahoo group and the, really the group consensus was, next slide please, that this is not safe to use. This is not a product that would keep a child safe in a crash. Um, so I asked the technician to call the family back and share those research results. And Stephanie Tombrello from Safety Belt Safe spotted my CPS listserv post, and she actually sent that notification to NHTSA at that time. And she was able to connect the technician with a reporter from the Washington Post who produced a really nice article on this topic all about um, imposter and counterfeit car seats. Um, so I will say the one thing I'd add about this scenario is that the technician was not able to get the contact information for the family. Um, she didn't fill out a checklist form because she didn't really do a checkup. You know, she just had a conversation with the caregiver and the children were not present. Um, so just in all that, getting caught up in having that good conversation, she wasn't able to write down their phone number so that she could follow up with them later. So I would recommend always using a checkup form and getting their contact information if you can. So next slide, please. All right, so what do we do when we are the technician at the checkup event, and this happens to us? We're gonna put on our poker face. <laughs> I don't have a great one, but I'm working on it. Um, we don't wanna say, what the heck is that? Um, hopefully we'll say, I'm so glad you came today. And um, I was not there to see how Carrie or Laurel responded to these caregivers, but I hope they responded in a kind and informative manner. And I hope that they listened, really listened to see what the needs of that family were that led to the purchase of these products. And then they can use that information to help advise the caregivers on options to fit those needs. Next slide, please. All right, so we're trying to work out through our checkup process, what are those caregivers and family members really asking? So let's go back to the basics of our technician certification module on caregiver communication. And our instructor guide tells us that caregivers may not want to ask a question if they perceive that it would not be socially desirable. So those caregivers, we want to remind them that there are no silly questions and that this interaction is about the safety of their child. So this chart here is still in the new curriculum, believe it or not, it's important enough that it's stuck around the latest version of the curriculum. And we're trying to figure out what parents are really asking or what they really need. So next slide, please. So let's do that exercise with the two scenarios that I presented. And I'm so sorry that we aren't all together in the same room so you can reply to me. Um, but let's think about it in that first, scenario with that Clipex product, the little strap and, and uh, clips that we're supposed to replace to booster seat. If the caregiver asks us, can I use this instead of a booster seat? It doesn't take up a lot of space. What might they really mean or what might they be facing in their setup? They might have a really small car or they might change vehicles a lot. Maybe that child needs to carry that product in their backpack throughout the school day. Uh, maybe you have a caregiver that can't lift a heavy seat or an older child that thinks boosters aren't cool. Um, so we want to really learn what that caregiver and that child are facing. And then what about that family that asked, can I use these portable car seats? They won't be in them a lot and they aren't bulky. So what I'm hearing there is that caregiver probably doesn't transport those children every day. 
Um, they're just an occasional transporter. Um, they might need to store that product in a trunk or somewhere where it doesn't take up a lot of space, um, or they might be tr looking for something that's low cost. Or in serious scenario of families that come to you with a foreign seat, maybe they just moved to the US, maybe they're a military family that bought that seat when they were abroad. So we really wanna listen and find out why they bought that non-traditional product. So again, by listening and determining their needs, we can help them come up with safe options and help recommend a category of products that would work for them. Next slide, please. So my response when I'm out at my job is partially led by the two organizations that I represent. So at Safe Kids, we're really directed that kindness does equal safety. So this is from our Safe Kids Worldwide brand guidelines in our tone section. It says, at our core, we are a safety organization and we need to be steadfast in communicating accurate information that will save lives. And it's equally important to present this information in a way that will resonate with parents and change behavior. We want parents and caregivers to know that we understand raising kids is a tough job. We're not here to lecture or blame if something goes wrong. Instead, we want them to know that when it comes to keeping their kids safe, they're not alone. Next slide, please. So at my lead agency hospital, our motto is, hello, human kindness. You might have seen our commercials if you're on the West Coast. And our Dignity Health Hospital system philosophy is that we aim for nothing less than to inspire change in healthcare that leads to more empathy, listening, and respect. Not simply because it's nice, but because it's good for us and because it works. So as CPSTs, we can listen and find out why they chose the fake seat and make them feel good about choosing a safer option. Next slide, please. All right, so that's out at checkup events, but you also might be in charge of something like a car seat hotline or a social media account, especially right now when a lot of us aren't doing in-person events. We might be doing a lot of social media. Um, so the 2020 CPST curriculum now includes a social media topic in module 12, interacting with caregivers. So if you haven't had a chance to help with a class, which might be a lot of us since this is usually prime class season, um, you might have, have had a chance to see this just yet. So in module 12, it now says, social media is an opportunity for positive education. It's an opportunity to engage in a format that can be easily shared, which is great. But we've got to keep in mind that our voice and our nonverbal communication cannot be seen when you're posting on social media. So we want to try to be compassionate and respectful of caregivers' decisions, just like we would in person. Next slide, please. All right, so module 12 actually has an activity now, a learn, practice, explain activity of responding to social media scenarios. It also discusses fear-based messaging and reminds us that it is not an effective technique. If a caregiver feels judged, they may not engage with you. So when we see, let's say a picture of a child in a car seat in our social media feed, um, let's do a little good, better, best. So good would be to thank them for having a child in a car seat, high five. Even better would be to thank them and compliment them for trying to address a specific need in a child. Like high five, you've got that kiddo in a booster seat because they're seven or eight years old, that's great. Even best would be to thank them, compliment them, and then invite them to a checkup event if you see something that in that photo that maybe is not best practice. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so one question that we have gotten from technicians on this is, what is my liability when it comes to a fake car seat, an imposter car seat, or a foreign car seat? How does liability come into play for me as a CPST? So of course, we're gonna do a lot of the things we normally do. We're gonna advise them not to use unsafe products, we're going to provide information on the safest way to ride. And then if they are, if that child is present at the checkup event, we're going to make sure they leave as safe as possible. And the way I think about this is that it's fairly similar to scenarios that you might have where a child comes in with a broken seat or a child that's not restrained. Hopefully you've already got some policies in place and some methods for how to deal with this. Um, maybe you're a seat that is able to distribute low cost seats or free seats free seats um, in your program, or they could have another family member bring a seat to the side or borrow one from a neighbor. Whatever you can do to get that child home safely that day and hopefully refer them to a low-cost program. So 
in all of these cases, the decisions are still made by the caregiver and you're gonna document, document, document. And in module two, our technician guide reminds us that as a technician, we're gonna never support a caregiver in either breaking the law or going against car seat or vehicle manufacturer instructions. In the, caregiver, in the cases where the caregiver does not make the safe choice, we're gonna document these actions on our checkup form. And documentation on a form with a liability release should be standard practice. And Denise actually has a handout for you that you're gonna be um, getting in your email after this session. So it's a handout all about liability. Next slide, please. So before our uh, media environment changed <laughs> quite a bit in the last few months, this issue was really in the news for us as CPSTs. Um, so under normal circumstances, you might get some press inquiries about this, or you might even have a chance to reach out to the media about this topic. And so as CPSTs, we can help put pressure on retailers and try to advise them to pull these products from their websites and their stores, and we can help make a difference in that way. And we can spread the word about these products to each other as the CPS community and to the public. So if you do get requests from the media, make sure you know your agency policies and how to interact with the media. And we wanna make sure we're speaking to our knowledge level. Uh, for me, I am a CPST instructor and I've checked a lot of car seats, but as I said, I'm not a manufacturer and I'm not a government body, so, and I'm not law enforcement. So I wanna make sure to refer to the experts if I get questions that would be best for those experts. Next slide, please. All right, so if that family's gonna drive away, what can we give them or point them towards? Um, like I mentioned, the healthychildren.org list is great. Um, if it's available, we're gonna send them to the car seat manufacturer. Safety Belt Safe has a handout called Warning, Fake and Unsafe Products. And the Car Seat Lady website has a great article called Knock Off Car Seats. And Beth is gonna tell you more about stopfakes.gov where there is a new handout on counterfeit child safety safety seats that you're gonna get in your email. All right, next slide, please. So just to wrap it up, um, what is my role in this scenario? So as a technician, it is my job to stay updated on new and emerging technologies and products. So thank you for joining this webinar. You're already on top of that. But I wanna know what's in the new products are on the market so I don't get that look on my face when things come in and I say, what the heck is that? Um, there are some products out there that I haven't experienced yet, but hopefully I know about them because I'm staying up to date. And that'll help me spot the differences between something new and innovative versus something that is a fake product. So it's my job to help educate caregivers and my community and to make reports to proper authorities when needed. And also to sign up for newsletters and things like Safe Ride News. And on the NHTSA website, even at the bottom, it says subscribe for updates. So you can get some of those email blasts when these issues come up. However, it's not my role to be the judge of what products would or would not be approved by NHTSA. And so I'm gonna make sure that I'm not trying to act like a regulating body, body. I'm just a technician, which is great. Um, and then I'm not gonna shame those caregivers for choosing an unsafe product. I'm gonna make them feel really good about choosing a safe way to ride. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of what hap happens on the ground when you come across these products. And I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Beth Wolf with NHTSA to give us a little perspective for what happens beyond the curbside. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't be in Tampa, um, but I hope everyone is safe and at home. I'm gonna give you an overview of somewhat the NHTSA side of child restraints and um, this issue of counterfeit products and what are legit products and what are not. Go ahead, next slide. This is a NHTSA organizational chart. Some of you may have seen this before and some of you may have not. Um, and I just wanted to point out all the boxes where there are areas of NHTSA where we have people working on child restraints. Um, or we call it child restraints because that's what it says in our regulations uh, through the Office of Enforcement. So child restraints are car seats. Um, it's kind of, that's just our version of saying things here. Um, but Office of Communications, Research and Program Development. Um, and then I worked in the Office of Enforcement. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on today to let you guys know uh, what we do on our side. 
Next slide. So the Office of Enforcement has actually three different groups. So you have the Office of Defects Investigation, which is where I work in. Um, you may know the Office of Defects Investigation with a lot of car issues, specifically like Takata airbags and things like that. But we also do child seats, child restraints. And then you have the Office of Vehicle Safety Compliance. They are the ones that oversee the 213 compliance testing and regulatory issues when it comes to compliance. So I think it's very important to know that my division and defects investigation is actually completely separate from the SMVSS 213 group, but we do work together. We work very closely together on a lot of different issues. So if you do have like a question relating to the compliance um, of a specific product, you can definitely file a complaint on NHTSA.gov and that I'll show you in just a second that actually goes to the Office of Defects Investigation. But if it's beyond our scope and purview of our office, we will definitely reach out to other offices um, within NHTSA that work in child restraints. And then the last part of the Office of Enforcement is odometer fraud. People may or may not know that that's a, um, an area that we oversee at NHTSA and we work with the Department of Justice to prosecute odometer fraud cases because it is a federal crime. Next slide. Office of Defects Investigation. We are quite large. We're about uh, 95 people in totality and each of the vehicle defects invest, uh, sorry, vehicle defects divisions. So we have um, five of them in total. They oversee different manufacturers within the light vehicle community, medium heavy duty, school buses, trailers, motorcycles, you name it. But in vehicle defect division B, we have an investigator that is assigned to child restraints and child seats. So when you go on NHTSA.gov to file your complaint, or it's called a vehicle owner questionnaire, that goes straight to the investigator in Vehicle Defect Division B. And then you'll notice in other parts of uh, ODI, or Office of Defects Investigation, we have an entire division that just does recalls. So if there's a recall on your child restraint for any sort of issue, there are people assigned to oversee that recall. And then you have my division, which is the Trends Analysis Division. And I deal with information that is mandated on a quarterly or monthly basis from manufacturers. So if manufacturers are bringing in child restraints into the United States, even one of them, they have to give us information. So I'm gonna hit that up in just one second. So next slide. So here's just a nice little summary. So VDDB, or Vehicle Defect Division B, they are the ones that receive your complaints from NHTSA.gov. Um, and that investigator reads them very quickly. We have investigators that go through their entire queue within about 24 to 48 hours. And the great thing is, is um, if your complaint is received and you provide us information such as your phone number and email, someone will call you. We will talk to you. We want to talk to you. Um, recall division. Yet again, they are the ones that do all of the recalls, either voluntarily by the manufacturers or if NHTSA opened an investigation and we initiated that recall. Um, and then my division, the Trends Analysis Division, yet again, we receive information from manufacturers that relates to their aggregate data production of how many car seats they're producing in a given year, death and injuries that they receive notices of, um, and also field report analyses. So if there is a complaint about a child restraint, um, quality uh, or defect, alleged defect or anything of that matter, we get those reports as well. And we do a lot of different analyses on a quarterly basis to help catch defects or safety related issues before they become a problem. Um, and I work very closely with the investigator in VDDB uh, with a lot of the data that I receive, and then he receives data from the other end, directly from the consumers and the public. So we get data from two different sides to help keep people safe. Next slide. Here's the mission of the uh, Trends Analysis Division where I am at. 
Um, so this regulation is a little old. It came in the um, early 2000s. Uh, but basically, we are here to identify issues early. We want to make sure we keep people safe. We want to save lives. And if we can get data on a very frequent basis, it may help us identify some of those issues to protect the public. Next slide. So the TRED Act, this is what oversees the Trends Analysis Division. And if you wanted to look the TRED Act up, here's it's 49 CFR Part 79, and it spells out what light vehicle manufacturers, medium heavy duty manufacturers, child restraint manufacturers, every type of person that's bringing in a vehicle or some sort of equipment into the United States related to an automobile or vehicle, it is in this regulation um, that we oversee. And um, the Trends Analysis Division are also early warning reporting. You may see that or EWR, it's the same thing. Uh, so 579.25 is the regulation specific for child restraints. And I mentioned this earlier, that if manufacturers are bringing in one child restraint into the United States, for sale, distribution, or they're trying to um, do some sort of uh, tactic to get that child seat into the market, um, then they are required to submit information to my division. Um, and non-compliance with this does have penalties. Um, we have the ability to fine individuals, there are civil penalties, other litigation. So if manufacturers are not complying with the regulations, we can take legal action. Next slide. So what types of data do we get? So I highlighted the green column here in a big red box um, to show what child restraint manufacturers are obligated to report. And on the left-hand side, you see that basically every category child restraint manufacturers has to provide to my division, um, either on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on what it is, except property damage claims. So you'll notice manufacturer communications and foreign recalls, or that little acronym there, it says SSVL, that is substantially similar vehicle. Um, so basically, if someone is um, selling a car seat in Canada, and they want to sell it in the United States, and it is substantially similar, it may be rebadged, rebranded, but it pretty much is the same seat, we have to get all of those communications. Um, fatalities and injuries, we have to get those. Um, and then yet again, I mentioned the field reports, but we also get aggregate claims of warranty claims and consumer complaints. So if you are calling your manufacturer to make a complaint about the product, we get the totality of how many of those that they receive on a quarterly basis. Next slide. So here's a, a tidbit to add to what was said earlier about uh, 213 compliance. And sometimes if you email NHTSA, you know, we'll take some time to uh, respond back to you if you have a product that you're not sure about. So the Office of Vehicle Safety Compliance, or OVSC, they are the ones that oversee 213. And to go to Zach Fraser's email that was um, mentioned earlier, so non-compliant child restraints. Um, these are the general facts of what OVSC um, has allowed us to share with you guys. So they need to have permanent visible labels. Um, it has to verify on that label. You saw the picture and the slides before here exactly uh, what it says in the Federal uh, Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. Um, it should have a name and address of that manufacturer or the distributor. So if you're buying a product and it has no labels whatsoever and it doesn't even say the brand name, it doesn't tell you when it was manufactured, then those are some pretty big red flags. Um, and what you can do if you come across a product that has some of these red flags, you can tell us, you can tell me, so we want to hear from you. Um, and so it's called a, uh, the complaint that you file on NHTSA.gov is called a vehicle owner questionnaire, even though this isn't a vehicle, we know that these are child seats, um, but I will show you uh, in the next couple of slides exactly what to do um, to file a complaint on NHTSA.gov. So next slide. So if you go to NHTSA.gov, 
Uh, and on the top right hand corner, it says report a problem. If you click on that box, it's going to bring you to this page. And then you'll notice there on the left hand side here, it says to report a safety problem. There's a vehicle form, you can do it online. There's another vehicle form if you want to submit it as a PDF document or via email. But then right here on this little tab, it says non-vehicle. If you click non-vehicle, it's gonna bring you to this lovely page here in the middle and you can select child restraints. Next slide. One question that we have received and it's very well taken is sometimes these brands are new or merging, sometimes the models change. And I had a car seat and it wasn't on the drop down menu. So what should I do? So one great thing that we've done on our VOQ or vehicle owner questionnaire page is we now have options to select other. So if you have a child restraint that doesn't have any markings, any labeling whatsoever, you can select other, other, other for all of these. And then also for the data manufacturer, you, there's a blank line that you can select so that it'll let you go to the next page if you don't know the date of manufacturer. So please go to next slide. Okay, great. I just actually want to take a second. Can we go back one slide? I'm so sorry. Um, as of last week, we now have added one new thing to this page that I didn't get a screenshot of. I'm so sorry, but you'll notice right here in the center, it says components. If you had clicked the next page button, it had, would have brought you to the components page. There is now a new component in the drop down menu that says, I suspect the car seat is counterfeit. So you can actually tell us and flag that I don't know the make or model or manufacturer, but it's because I also believe the seat could be counterfeit. So that is a new thing that we literally just added within the past week. Uh, now we can go to the next slide. So if you come across an alleged counterfeit seat, so it looks like a specific brand, um, uh, all the markings kind of look like it, but there are just some red flags that we kind of talked about, like it didn't come with um, a manufacturing uh, label that's very specific or, or whatever it may be, that's, we know that it's happening and especially on the online markets and things like that, but we want to know about it. But ultimately the public, I think, isn't aware that NHTSA does not have the enforcement power to uh, take these counterfeit claims and actually really do some type of enforcement action we actually have to rely on another government agency that can prosecute or investigate uh, intellectual property theft and infringement. And we have made a new partner at the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Administration that deals with this. And they, the Department of Commerce is actually the one that oversees the stopfake.gov account. And so if you file a complaint um, with NHTSA.gov that I believe this seat may be counterfeit, we will receive that complaint. And internally at NHTSA, we may work with each other and communicate with each other, but ultimately, we're gonna be making that a referral to our friends at Department of Commerce because ultimately they're the ones that can actually really um, take that information and use their enforcement authorities to, to do something with it. So next slide, please. If you go to stopfakes.gov, this is their homepage. If you, on the right hand corner, it says contact us. If you click that button, it's going to bring you to this lower hand section right here and it says email us. If you click that email us, it will pop up in your um, specific web browser or whatever you're working on at the moment and you can email them directly. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of different scenarios now um, to address a lot of things that I have talked about, but also kind of wrap up what the presenters before us have also told. So scenario number one is I came across a car seat that I suspect does not comply with SMVSS 213. What do I do? First thing we suggest is to go to NHTSA.gov and complete the online form that I just showed you. 
Um, and if you are a CPS tech, we highly encourage your parents, your caregivers, and your guardian to not use that seat. Um, if, if they don't believe that it complies to these safety standards, then we can't guarantee it's going to keep you safe. Uh, so please just file a complaint and uh, to what Jennifer was saying earlier, find an alternative method to maybe get them another seat um, or kindly encourage them to, to not use it for their safety. Next slide. I came across a child restraint that I think could be fake or counterfeit or other terms, imposter, um, whatever uh, you believe the, the product may be. Um, what should I do or what should I tell the parents to do? So the best thing from the in enforcement side, document, document, document. Not only from what you're telling the conversation of that caregiver or parent as a CPS tech, but also if there's not a paper trail of how that seat was purchased, where it was purchased, um, how was the money transferred? Was it done on PayPal? Was it done on Amazon? Was it done um, in another method or means? All of that documentation is very, very important, but also um, the pictures of the actual um, child seat of restraint, any labels or markings that it has, those are all very, very important. Next thing you need to do is call the manufacturer. If you believe you purchased a specific brand of car seat, then call that manufacturer. They will be able to talk to you um, about what specific labels and marking, markings are specifically on their car seats. Um, you could also read the serial numbers to make sure that the car seat that you have is legitimate. Um, but the manufacturer will be able to provide you a lot more information um, about that seat. And then yet again, you can file a complaint with stopfakes.gov or you can file a complaint on NHTSA and we will work with stopfakes in the Department of Commerce to make sure that your complaint gets into the, the hands of the right people. All right, next slide. All right, I came across a child restraint that is damaged, broken, and potentially defective. What do I do? From my aspect, this is exactly what I review every single day, is I review a lot of information, uh, not only about alleged defects, but things that consumers have complained to the manufacturers about. So when something like this happens, if you're doing a, a child seat check or whatever, and you're seeing that the straps are frayed or the base is cracked, whatever it may be, call the manufacturer. Um, and if this issue falls under warranty, great, then the consumer or the parent or the caregiver can work with that manufacturer to uh, remedy that issue. If it's sending them a new seat, sending them a new part, whatever it may be, um, the manufacturer can work with that person directly. Step number two is yet again, gather documentation. Was there a receipt, an email? Um, I know some of the manufacturers that we work with, without proof of purchase, they can't send you a replacement seat or a replacement part. So I would highly encourage parents just to keep everything. As soon as they buy that seat, keep every single bit of documentation from that purchase. Um, even as a CPS tech, if you were at a uh, child seat uh, check and you were doing your form to make sure that uh, the child seat was installed correctly and things like that, and you're noticing that there's damage to the seat that seems odd or not, typical or normal, sometimes we do see in our net side that CPS techs will include their documentation in with the complaint that the parent or the caregiver is making to the manufacturer. So sometimes having your documentation in supplement to what the parents and caregivers are giving is extremely helpful, um, either to confirm or deny that the issue was um, legitimate or um, if the product was actually being used correctly versus consumer misuse, uh, your documentation can be very helpful to us at NHTSA um, because it does get clustered into these uh, field reports that we get or other warranty claims and other information that we can get from the manufacturers. Uh, but this is the third point here is actually very important. Please file a complaint with NHTSA.gov, and if the manufacturer wants you to send that seat back to them, take the pictures, get all the documentation before sending it back to the manufacturer, because sometimes this does happen that a child seat is sent back to the manufacturer, and 
the parent later on wants to file a complaint with NHTSA.gov, but they've already sent the seat back, so they don't know the serial number. They don't know the date of manufacture. They weren't able to take pictures of the labels. They weren't able to take pictures of what the alleged problem was. So we're encouraging people to, to gather all that documentation first before sending it back to the manufacturer and also before filing a, a complaint with NHTSA.gov. Next slide. That is it for me, and I will wrap it up by saying that we at NHTSA um, take our job very seriously. We really go to work every day to make sure that not only children are safe, but that every single person is at home at night to make sure that everyone's at the dinner table. We really do truly care about the health and safety and well-being of people on our roadways, and we really appreciate the honor to serve all of you and keep you safe. So please let us know what we can do for you. Thanks, Beth, and um, thank you to Denise and Sarah and Jennifer for your presentations. Um, we do have time for Q&A. I know that you did cut out some of your presentations, so before I ask some of the questions from the field, is there anything that um, any of our speakers would like to say, clarify, or provide more information on before we continue? Okay, well, they're all still muted, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. Okay. Well, actually, let's Jennifer, um, I'm sorry, Denise? Let's, let's hear their questions. All right. So first, I want to thank everybody for your questions. We're probably not going to have time to ask them all. Um, but you um, do have some contact information, and you can also email us at webinars at savekids.org, and I can forward any questions that you have. Um, Jennifer, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the primary response um, or messaging of the technician when they see a new seat, because one thing you said that was very interesting, um, we had a couple questions about it, about identifying new and innovative things that, seats that look a little bit unusual, such as the Wavy or maybe the Nania Baby Ride, versus a fake seat. Sure, so just how to, I'm sorry, was the question how to respond when we see those? Mm-hmm. Okay, I think well, I think, cool. yeah, so I'll break that in, down into two parts. I think first is our, homework before we get out to the checkup events. So hopefully we're subscribed to great things like Safe Ride News and we're listening to our Safe Kids webinars. And um, if you have the chance to go to a con national conference or attend a local CEU class with someone that did go to the national conference and to see the new products, hopefully you've heard about some of these products before they come in. But on the chance that you haven't, which you know can happen certainly, and when someone comes in, we just again kind of slide on our poker face and say, "Oh, this is really interesting." You know, I personally haven't seen this before, and you know what? That is okay to admit. I think in any part of our job, our life, it's okay to say, "You know, I honestly haven't seen this one before." Here, come over here to the picnic table. Let's sit down and look at this product together. Let's, of course, let's break out the instruction manual. Let's read the labels together, and let's learn about it together. Um, in some of our programs, uh, we might be lucky enough to talk to families on the phone in advance, and so you can ask them, you know, what kind of seat they're bringing in, how many children they're bringing in, um, and so you can do a little bit of that research in advance, but I know that's not possible most of the time. So if they do come in with something you haven't seen before, say, okay, you know, uh, do you have plenty of time today? Because we're going to sit down and we're going to learn about this together, and you're going to read the labels, and you're going to go through the instruction manual to make sure it's something that looks legit, like we've talked about. Um, and you'll do your best to guide them that day. You'll work through it together, go through your process, go through your checklist form process that'll guide you through. Um, and then if you get to the end and say, okay, you know, I think we did a good job to let you leave safe today, but you know what, I'm gonna go back to my office tonight and I'm gonna do some extra research. Is it all right if I call you tomorrow um, to talk a little bit more about it? So is there anything anybody would add to that? Well, I think I think your point is good, though. You, the idea is that you don't just jump right on and go, "Wow, that looks like a fake." <laughs> yeah, you know, you 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 walk through it with them and 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 do your homework. And it does definitely help to have uh, to keep on top of of new innovations because there really are a lot of new innovations coming out. And so we do need to be able to identify uh, one versus the other. Yeah, and we we're talking, you know, it is going to be hard this year. We are used to sending representatives from our local coalitions to places like Lifesavers or Kim Conference or PrevCon. You know, we send, <laughs> we have just the money to send one or two people to go learn about those products and then bring that knowledge back to our communities. So we might have to work a little 
extra hard this year to learn about those things, um, to bring that knowledge back to our communities if you're a leader amongst your local CPSTs. Okay, um, we had some questions and I believe Beth, these are gonna be for you. It's, I'm gonna combine uh, two of them. Um, Cindy says a friend sent a photo of like a head cushion that snaps onto the bars of the vehicle headrest. It holds the child's head in place like when they're on a, a backless booster. Is that something that will be reported to NHTSA? Or that could be reported? To me, um, that's a good question. Um, so if it's not physically attached to the booster seat itself, then that would be an aftermarket product. Um, and that would not necessarily fall under the purview, though it kind of fall under the same guidance as what Zach Frazier gave with the Clipix. Um, that it, as long as they're not claiming to meet 213, then it's not going to fall under the purview of NHTSA. But if there are any safety concerns or anything related to that aftermarket product, then I would call the manufacturer themselves. And I would think in that case, they would need permission from the vehicle manufacturer to use it since it attaches to the seat, the vehicle seat? Potentially. Potentially. I think it's also very important, like we've learned from our CPS tech courses, that reading the manufacturer instructions, not just for the car seat itself, but also from the vehicle. Um, it, that can be also very, very, very important here. If the, the vehicle um, is not made or designed to have those different types of products, then uh, we encourage not for them not to be used. But yet again, I would call the manufacturer of the product itself to ask any questions related to uh, safety issues. Great. The reason why I asked is because we have a question from Katrina and she's wondering, um, you know, if she sees like an aftermarket lower anchor set up, you know, for a vehicle or a lower anchor connector set up for a car seat that is not approved by the manufacturer, how would they also be able to report like that latch system to your site? Right now for my division and who I work with in the Office of Defects Investigation, we only really deal with products that are self-certified 213. So if those products are not claiming to meet 213 or do not fall under 213, then you can still file a report with NHTSA.gov and we can help get those complaints to the right people that could answer those questions. Uh, but for my job specifically, that is not a product that would fall under my purview. Carrie, can I ask a question of Beth? Hello? I can hear you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I muted myself so you wouldn't hear me typing response. Oh, sorry. So, Beth, I, I'm speaking to what I think is your purview. Um, you mentioned that you would need to get, um, if they sell even one product, you would get a a quarterly report. So I'm curious if the seller of the portable car seat is in compliance with with submitting quarterly reports to you. The one that 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 portable one that really is nameless, but Jen, Jennifer talked about. That is a good, uh, very good point. Uh, so for my part of Office of Defects Investigation, the first part of our um, 49 CFR 579 is we require manufacturers that are selling products that self-certified to be 213. So for those products that um, we saw that were the, the strap-ons to the back side of the, um, the car seat that didn't have labels, those products, no, but those are also equipment manufacturers. They are required to give some information. And if you go back in the slides to see that handy-dandy chart um, that I had about the different types of data people have to submit, so equipment manufacturers have to submit very little information on a quarterly basis um, as compared to other types of manufacturers. But long story short, if they are not self-certifying or claiming to meet 213, then we don't hold them to any standards for reporting. Okay. Great. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, I do want to make sure that um, each of you will be able to share any parting thoughts or comments before we let go. Uh, before we let everybody go, I know this was an unusually long webinar. We had a lot of content. I want to thank 
uh, Denise, Beth, Jennifer, and Sarah for putting together such a well-organized presentation whose components really complemented each other, and um, the hundreds of technicians that have joined us today. Um, you will be getting a survey. Please do fill it out, um, and you'll be getting a confirmation email this evening that will have links to a PDF of the presentation as well as links to the handouts. I know that one of the links was broken, so the links will be in the handouts. Um, so if uh, I'm going to open it up to our speakers to see if you have any final thoughts or ideas or comments that you'd like to share with our technicians today. Carrie, this is Sarah, and I just wanted to, uh, in that conversation of knowing new products and being aware of what's out there, and you know Jennifer rightly noting that there aren't as many conferences happening right now. Uh, remember that we have really great resources online and on the CPS board website. There's often a lot of manufacturer product update presentations, so you always have that opportunity to review product updates, and and those are still continuing because we can still do these webinars, which is fabulous. So thank you, Carrie, uh, for helping to host them and thank you to the CPS board for making sure they're always posted. Yeah, thank you, Denise and Carrie, for keeping in, keeping it alive even after it got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here and miss seeing everybody at conferences, but glad to see you all here. Hey, everybody, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and thank you so, so much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>